Thank you all so much for joining me for another session for Data for God. Today, it is my absolute pleasure to be able to introduce to everybody Paul I'm sorry, Paul Elliott and Tom Allen. I knew I would mess it up at some point, but it's okay. So Paul and Tom, welcome to the show, guys. Hey, Eric. Hi, welcome. Hi, Eric. Awesome, awesome. Well, just to give you guys a little bit of a background on who Tom and who Paul are, Tom is a highly experienced banking executive, having held a number of senior executive roles within the financial services industry. Having started his career with Bank of America, Tom moved to Asia Pacific with Credit Suisse and built a career spanning investment banking, trading, asset management, and private banking and wealth management. In his time in Asia, Credit Suisse grew to over 9,000 employees, 17 countries, and with an asset base of over 250 billion U.S. dollars. Now, in recent years, though, Tom was the Global Director of Digital Solutions and Operations at Vision Fund International, the microfinance arm of World Vision. Tom is also a serial entrepreneur, having built and sold a number of businesses across education, consultancy, advisory, and financial services. Tom has held a number of non-executive board roles across varying industries. Now, his career has allowed him to experience all elements of the financial services spectrum, offering banking services to both billionaires and poverty-stricken alike, and in the middle market in between. This experience is highly applicable to what Paul and Tom are actually getting into in the terms of if bank strategic plans. So Tom has been active in his church in Asia and Canada, participating as a youth pastor, elder, and volunteer with a focus on social welfare and homelessness, which actually, Tom, I don't know if you know, but we had an interview with Atlanta and their homeless yep. mission, actually. It was really yep, neat. I how saw. Yeah, very cool. Paul, on the other hand, is a commercial senior executive with more than two decades of finance and operational leadership in the three C-suite positions in financial services, insurance, and professional services. So after qualifying as a chartered accountant with EY, he became CFO of Vitrian Capital, I knew I pronounced that wrong, in 1997, and CEO of Open and Direct in 1999. Now over the next seven years, Paul led operations to grow the, to grow the business. He also led a private equity-backed management buyout and subsequent divestment that produced excellent stakeholder returns. So Paul actually joined Vision Fund International as well, progressing to the global COO. And that's actually where we sort of all met was through Vision Fund International. And this is where Paul directed 500 million U.S. dollar portfolio and the C-suites across four continents, leading global field operations in 30 countries with more than 7,000 staff. By unifying network operations, Paul increased portfolio size and quality just two years and I'm sorry, within just two years and led substantial and profitable growth across the network. Paul has also served as a chair and non-executive director in a range of professional services and insurance broking businesses. He's also a senior elder at his local church and having been heavily involved in developing its strategy, its delivery, and in many aspects of its work for the last 35 plus years. And more importantly, I think both of them have an amazing accent while I do not. So let's go ahead and just get that out of the way to start. <laughs> so gentlemen, thank you so much for, for coming out and joining. I, I know that you, know, you guys have worked on so many really interesting things. I'm sort of going to ask you to harken back to your, your roles at, at Vision Fund International a little bit. And actually, I've, I've interviewed Karen Lewin, who is at Vision Fund International still, mm -hmm. about some of the work that they do. Great person. But I'd love for you guys to help the audience learn a little more about each of you. You know, based on your backgrounds, you have tons of experience in finance and banking and microfinance. How did you even go down this career path? You know, how did you go down this notion of helping people through banking? You go first, Tom. <laughs> age, bef age before beauty. Age before beauty. Uh, it was definitely an opportunity and a God moment, Eric. Um, I'd left banking in 2010, as you said, a, uh, an interesting and uh, quite a, a broad spectrum and career over there. And uh, I got to know Vision Thrun through a lot of connected dots. Mm -hmm. And it was a great opportunity when I met them to suddenly realize actually everything I'd learned in mainstream could be and needed to be applied within the microfinance space. So uh, they, took a, uh, they took a leap of faith on me and vice versa. And uh, yeah, I joined. Uh, interestingly, I joined as their global head of IT and operations and the like. That's not my background. I, um, I know the use of all of those pieces, um, but God opened doors and thankfully I was able to, uh, to join, meet Paul. Uh, obviously, that's where he and I are now in our partnership together. But uh, it was a great experience to actually take it from mainstream finance and you know, jump into that NGO space, 
And as you said in your in your opening, I you know I've gone from banking billionaires to meeting clients in the middle of Africa who were subsistence farming, yeah. and the reality was they needed the same standard, same support, same financial help as the big boys. It was just a different change of the number. It wasn't a change of process or service, but actually it was just a different amount, and that that suddenly blew me away. And it was a great opportunity. Loved it. And I think, I mean, it's clearly obvious that, as Tom had mentioned, that um, he wasn't head of IT since before this call started. He couldn't even <laughs> get a blurred background on the Skype background. But anyhow, apart from that, Tom, it's, it, it was a vision fund where I met Tom. Um, and I think, you know, for, for me, it was it was definitely a god moment, too, because I really didn't know much about microfinance. I'd worked in the finance industry, hadn't really a clue until a friend of a friend had mm. kind of introduced me to a headhunter who then pulled me into vision fund. And and I kind of realised, oh, good grief, you know, there's a, a lot of commercial experience that I've gained in the financial services sector, particularly loans. Uh, and you kind of think, well, actually, that what we're doing here in microfinance is is just that in a much smaller way, yeah. but also a much more missional way. Um, and I think that so drawing into that, that was probably God drawing me in through a friend, a really good friend. Um, and then when you get into it, you then realize the potential that microfinance has to really change people's lives at, at the core. Um, but also actually working in a Christian microfinance, you know, the, the, the other thing that I really hadn't expected was just the, the whole um, the spiritual aspect of what, and dimension of what we did not directly with clients but actually working together and i think that was a huge huge blessing to me and to tom and, and many people who work in vision Canada and other yeah. christian microfinance but but certainly that was the bit that really blew me away in the sense that i really wasn't expecting that you kind of knew you were coming into yeah. that sort of an organization but when you're actually working together at a commercial level but also with a spiritual dimension actually it really was quite transformational for me it was a much bigger blessing on me than i was ever a blessing on vision fund that's awesome. I love how you both hinted at this notion, right? That, you know, people are people, you know, no matter how big their bank accounts are, they, they still need to be served yeah. and they still need help. And that's what we're called to do is to serve and to help. And so I, I love that aspect of it. I love that. You know, so many times in this world, we, we, we rank people ourselves, even though we're told by Christ not to, right? And so it's, it's that same idea. So that's perfect. So how did your roles at Vision Fund International really use data to help with their mission? I think initially, obviously, data was, was you know within a loan operation, within a lending business, which which microfinance is, understanding that you've lent money and what the repayment profile was, mm -hmm. and ultimately how that transformed into any form of profitability within a network was fundamental. The reality is, data was key in terms of both targeting clients, mm -hmm. looking at how clients repaid, and then ultimately how that transformed itself into mm -hmm. some form of profitability. So. That, that was kind of the key piece. The reality mm -hmm. was when we came in and when I came in, it was quite um, scary to see what let little data was around or what consistent data. But ultimately, that was helping drive the mission because ultimately, once we determined that, uh, looked at what the performance was, could then move most of our organizations to some level of profitability, which which ultimately sounds okay but commercial, but the bottom line for that is it then meant that they didn't need donor funding to help them survive and fund the losses, but allowed them to then target their resources much better. It also helped them, the data also helped us understand what our clients were and who they were, yeah. and also helped to target, are we actually targeting the right client mm -hmm. um, in terms of the true missional sense? And ultimately, um, in the sense that uh, as part of a Christian organization, there were missional funds were raised for helping a certain need the fact is if we could move our entities through the use of data to profitability then that actually meant that we were able to purely direct missional funds to go directly to resources rather than in any shape or form fund operating losses or costs so ultimately the use in the big picture of data that's kind of where we certainly saw at a vision fund level where it helped with mission oh that's awesome that's awesome so how do you guys encourage and this goes beyond even potentially vision fund how do you guys encourage others in an organization to just use data more effectively and efficiently i mean like you just described paul the use of data is literally making impact missionally on people's lives so how do you guys encourage others in an organization to do this i think um to a very large extent it was setting expectations at the senior level mm -hmm. first you know what yeah. were we expecting 
data, what data were we expecting to be used? How do we, why do we think it was needed? Explaining all of that at the very outset. Um, actually, in many aspects, we realized that people didn't understand why did they just plug information into a system and therefore then what was it being used for? There was lots of data going in, but actually what the outputs of that really, really was and how it was used. So for us at a, at a network level and, and Tom and myself particularly was about setting expectations at the senior level in our mm. organization and across our network about this is why we're doing it. These are the, this is what we're expecting and this is what is needed. Identifying what was mandatory right across the network. Um, some people just thought it was it was okay to have some pieces of data, some not. And um, it was educating users as to how and why. And it was about getting a real clarity of, of info. Um, so it was a combination of that. And sometimes that required encouragement. Um, sometimes it required a carrot and a stick, as Tom would have said, <laughs> in many yep. respects. So yep. I think there was an aspect of that. And, and, and another aspect for us was, was also listening to what was happening on the ground and the problems that they were re- they were facing in terms of either collecting the data. Uh, in many instances, we were collecting so many data fields. And then yeah. when we actually asked the question, what are we using it for? Um, maybe we weren't. And therefore, you found the loan officers on the ground were collecting data, taking a lot of time on the ground to get it. Mm. And the reality is when, when they couldn't see the need for it or the use of it, then then they were maybe a bit more laissez-faire about whether they got it or not. So getting an entire organization, understanding what the data was for, why it was important to collect it at the outset, how, how it's important for it to be accurate, um, and why that was, was really a key piece of education. But also sometimes it did require the carrot and stick. Isn't that right, Tom? Yeah, yeah it is. Now, do you remember when we... Uh... When we first looked at this, they were collecting, you know, almost 300 yes. data points in the field. Um, that's amazing. I think for both Paul and I coming from yeah. commercial, we didn't collect that much data from clients. <laughs> you know, it, it was it was uh, it was quite phenomenal. And as Paul said, you know, then the question was, why are we collecting this? You know, it's an incredible amount of effort. I think both Paul and I were very we learned very quickly. We were sending our loan officers out, you know, 100 kilometers out into the bush on a on a motorbike in a hot and sweaty environment to collect 300 data points that realistically when they came back to the office very few of them were used most of them ignored and nobody ever actually asked any questions about the quality or what was going on so mm. that was really that we started with the grassroots you know we we senior management obviously always want to know what's going on <laughs> But if we, if Paul and I had been the same loan officers in the field trying to collect this, both Paul and I had said, there's no way we would have collected this because we knew yes. nobody was looking at it. So actually, we we really fundamentally took the view of we had to change it at the grassroots to start with, and then it permeate back from there. So yeah, a lot of fun in that process. <laughs> and like you guys said, it's one of those things, right? Like an appreciation for data up and down the chain is key. Yeah. Because you know, yeah, appreciating absolutely. data at the top can only get you so far, and appreciating data at the bottom when there's no one at the top to be able to look at it, it can only get you so far. So you know, trying to yeah. educate all the way down is is perfect. Love it. Yeah, and that behavioral thing was probably for both of us. You know, was technical and systems and changing. You know, the sort of the formality of stuff was problematic. You know, mm-hmm. and gray hairs and wrinkles for both of us. Actually, I think for both of us, that change aspect of, as you say, helping people understand yeah. why do we collect the data? Why is it important? What should I do with it once I've got it? And is someone else looking at this with me and it influencing decisions and approach? And that's for us the big key. Data for the sake of it is just data. You know, yeah. Data with a use is far more powerful. I think the other aspect in terms of the people piece was that in in our previous backgrounds, we would probably have dealt with probably a higher level of professional aspects yeah. of, of people's background, whereas in a developing organization like microfinance, it couldn't afford to attract always yeah. true, you know, the original yeah. professional. So you're training from the bottom right up to, yeah. to allow you to sort of fit a certain, you know, cost profile. Mm-hmm. And so therefore, when people are coming without that sort of background to understand why do they need that that mm. they don't really understand unless you tell them unless you educate them that yeah. this is yeah. why we need to collect this they just yeah. see it sometimes as well i just need to do this and that seems to be a waste of time on occasion so yeah. Yeah. understanding where our staff truly were and came from and yeah. then therefore the need to, to educate them was yeah. was really critical yeah. huge yeah 
Oh, man. Yeah, right. So, and this may actually sort of lead in, you know, to, to this next piece. One of the biggest things I've learned, at least in my career, is that more data usually equals more problems. <laughs> and so, <laughs> yes. what are some of the challenges you guys, you know, ran into when it came to data and getting more data and all of those aspects of a problem? So actually, back to that comment we made earlier, when, when we first, you know, opened this first layer of the onion, mm -hmm. you know, we... They had, you know, made a huge effort to basically work out, oh, well, we need 300 data points, mm -hmm. trying to peel that back and say, actually, what do we really need? You were part of that process with me on some of the uh, some of the uh, work we did in some of the MFIs, you know, pairing that down from 300 to actually we wanted less than 30 mm -hmm. common data points across every MFI, across the 30 odd, you know, banks that we had. Um, was key and trying to get 30 similar data points across 30 MFIs <laughs> took us nine months. So to put it in perspective, there was, an, as you say, there was an incredible obsession with data and we had masses of it. Yeah. Um, we were collecting stuff that was maybe useful, but actually most times ignored. Yeah. For then a lot of the data, it was on a paper, hard copy in the inner branch, you know, mm -hmm miles hundreds of miles sometimes away from the you know a central pot let alone whether that was automated or not yeah and then the ability for anyone to be able to look at that use it and apply it as paul said and therein lies that first thing so actually a lot of housekeeping discipline carrot and stick moment a lot yeah. of stick if i can put it that way um on the basis of we needed to get people to actually do a lot of housekeeping to get down to that first let's deal with the first 30 points um and that organization, Vision Founder, have been still wrestling with that and continue to this day because every time they add another set of criteria, yeah. it means going back out to, as Paul said, even to the nth degree in the field to get people to consistently uh, to do that. So, yeah, a, a real uh, a real journey and a half to get at least consistency yeah. and then, you know, the quality of that to be able to be used. Yeah. And I think the, the use of, the, of the, that data then in terms of yeah. what that produced and how that produced and, and also driving our teams um, to really start to use that was critical because then yeah. once some of them saw, yes, I can now see what a, you know, in an MFI, I can now see what my loan officers are putting on yeah. real time yeah. um, was really critical. And, and for certainly some of the more progressive uh, MFIs in the network, who started to use that, it started to then drive behavior change at the loan officer level going, ah, somebody's actually saying that I'm actually putting this information in. Yeah. The reporting then on that in terms of moving back into sort of one central database, which was part of that whole transformation, uh, was, was putting it into one place. We had our data all over the place in multiple systems, yeah. reported multiple times, and sometimes calculated certain KPIs in a slightly different format and, and i think even just that headache of bringing it into one place that both operational and finance systems took the same data yeah. did the same calculations that also was a you know for for people like ourselves who, who really drive on that and go on this this level of inconsistency drives you up the walls and it yeah. drove me up the walls <laughs> um, particularly when somebody's scoring a par 30 you know loss ratio of x and it's and it's y and something else you go well what's the difference and it's both the same data points so it's it was driving that to a level of consistency so by putting it into one central database yeah. that fed out from the core systems it allows us allowed us to do that and the other aspect of that then was that it helped us speed up the our month end close as a result yeah. of doing that which got the data in allowed us to do it on many of our mfis just due to lack of resources, they were producing monthly uploads, whereas some of the larger ones were daily uploads and from core banking. So yeah. that obviously had other positive impacts. But I think driving it into one allowed us to then have one common set of data that everybody in the organization at a senior level were, was using the same data. And therefore, me as COO, the next level of the senior management team, and then each MFI's management team had the same report. They knew that what I was looking at they knew what our senior management team, including Tom, were looking at going, well, these are the things that we're saying for the next year, 18 yeah. months are important as our KPIs. And we would we would have we would have decided to change some around, some were core, but some were changing. Therefore, that allowed us to say, well, this is what's on our thing. So if you, you do expect at the end of the month 
if you have a, a really weird number in one of those KPIs, mm. we will be looking at the same information. So get it helped, help drive and improve performance because it helped our management teams know, well, these aspects are different, are, are important if they didn't already know that. I mean, I think many of our organizations did know that, but, but some were obviously evolving and therefore, yeah. um, to be fair to them and therefore I think getting that level. Yeah. Funny anecdote. The um, I won't mention the the country or the uh, or the you know, or the C-suite uh, names, but uh, we were presenting to one of the MFIs about how we were starting to use this data and the centralized system and all those pieces, and the the C-suite were were overwhelmed. And this is brilliant. We can now see what our loan officers are doing in the field. These reports, then and, and for about 45, 50 minutes, they uh, they they work through this process with a massive smile on their face, going, "This is how we can now start to." And then one of them asked the question, "Who else can see this?" So at that point, when they heard that you know the uh, Paul and you know the various levels of management in between could see the same data at the same time in the <laughs> same format that they could. Mm. So they had taken the view of this is brilliant from my perspective because I can now fo- you know, focus down from my vantage point. They love that. <laughs> as soon as they realized someone further up the chain over their shoulder was looking at the same things to be able to, from their vantage point, have those conversations, start prodding and looking and, you know, trying to encourage certain things and disciplines and changes and behaviors and all that. That suddenly became a very different conversation because all of a sudden that same individual or that same management team suddenly went from, this is brilliant to no, because now all of a sudden the reality was that, yeah, up and down the chain, there was transparency. Everybody was looking at the numbers. And, you know, we mentioned it before, but I, I, I think one of the biggest things we saw was how this data and the use of data actually has to change people. It has to change reality, if we can put it that way. And, you know, microfinance is such a people business. It's about impact. How do you get people up and out of poverty? And for both Paul and I, it, we, you know, part of the reason why we are together now, we gelled in our view of data and reporting and all of these solutions were for one reason and one reason only, to help people. It want, we wanted to change how our management teams behaved, how they served, how the, how we impacted in the field. So, yeah, obsessing of data is great. Use of data is key. People are the niche point of where you need to be able to find those and being able to do something with it. Yeah. It takes a lot of work. I suppose, yeah, and I suppose one extra thing to add, really, which wasn't really an answer to your question about challenges, but the recognition for us is that we would never have got this massive transformation underway had we not had, and, and through, had we not actually had a team of people, and particularly led by Tom's team, who were actually helping the MFIs driving. And if we just said we want to do this <laughs> to a network of 30, and, and please just do it, it just wouldn't yeah. have happened. The reality <laughs> was it required... But, but I think there is a learning there for yeah. entities, which is that they already have a day job. They already have a busy sort of life in the yes. MFI. Unless yeah. you're trying to get transformational change through, you need to dedicate some resource yeah. behind it. And that's, yeah, that's one of the things that we did. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that analogy you guys use because I, I almost, and I know both of you guys are, are dads as well. I almost think about that sometimes when, you know, when we have our perspective with God, where we look down on our children and go, now you guys need to listen to what I said and make sure yeah. you do this. And then you're like, oh, wait, God's looking over my shoulder too? Oh, yeah. whoa, hold on. I feel yep. a little bit more uncomfortable about this whole situation now. <laughs> yep, yep, yeah. I don't know about you, but he keeps sending me the reports and they're not as green as I would like them. Yeah, he sees the same report you do, but for some reason he sees it differently. I don't know what it is. <laughs> yes. I think there's a problem with that reporting system. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Possibly colorblind, maybe, because mine always look green. Thankfully, I have good friends and relationships in my life like you two who can prod me along as well. That's what exactly. I like about it. We're here to keep you straight, my friend. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So on the opposite side of challenges, what is some of the success stories that you guys have had from Vision Fund? I mean, it may be sort of like what you guys described with that idea of collecting of data. That seems like a huge success story. I think, yeah, certainly having the one common data set across the 30 entities was a massive. And as Tom said, it took about nine months to get that yeah. both 
in play and accurate and consistently reported upon. So that was a massive exercise. But to then have that and then be reporting off the back of that was a big one. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the other thing for me was then starting to see some of the more large, usually it was the larger entities, starting to use that data and that reporting tool out of that database to drive their own performance themselves without having to be kind of um, driven by or told to do it. When you started seeing their entities using that to help look at loan officer performance or delve down into client performance at their own entity level themselves and taking their own initiative to doing that, to me that was that was the you know the real icing on the cake in that sense um, because that actually showed that they really valued oh yes there's a reason why this data and I can start to use it for much better and improvement and therefore ultimately it did help improve. Um, performance in those entities without a clear shadow of a doubt but that was down to the management seeing the potential and in, in what was there yeah yeah no I agree with that you know I think certainly from um, running that change process and the, you know the team that you know we're in the weeds of this I think going from trying to push this out mm -hmm. to receiving the pull from the fields mm -hmm. when that moment changed that was a beautiful moment that was as Paul said it was nice to see um, you know not just management teams but actually again within those organizations where they had you know made the effort to cascade this down you know, people in the field were asking, can I get my data? Can I get it quicker? You know, it's like, well, OK, we've gone from zero. Now you want us to get to 100 overnight. Yeah. But we love the we love the, um, you know, the attitude and the desire to see that, you know, people started to work those things out. So that was that was really encouraging. I think one of the, the most amazing conversations I had was actually with the loan officer using his reports um, and understanding his clients better. That was fundamentally the moment when you actually went, actually, data is here for a reason, you know, yeah. and uh, this particular loan officer worked out. He had a client who was a producer of um, you know, vegetables and he also had a market seller of vegetables um, and he'd never up until the point he'd always just he'd done his day job. He had done what we'd asked him to do but had never joined the dots. And actually the data helped him join the dots. And he introduced the two clients together because the, the producer was struggling to find a place and was having to try and sell further and further afield and was struggling on that basis. You know, and in you know the middle of Africa, if you're a subsistence farmer, that is harder than we, we know and recognize. And here was a market trader just a few kilometers away who was looking for, you know, quality produce and, up until the data, this poor loan officer would never have joined those dots. And he knew both uh, both clients. He knew what was going on. But then he suddenly went that light bulb moment of actually, you know, the whole point of the data was to make an impact. And the impact for us was to change lives. You change lives by applying product and data in a unique way that solves a real life situation. And so for me, and I think for the project team, that was those were two very key moments suddenly the pull of the data from the field we want this rather than you know what do paul and tom know about doing microfinance in the field mm -hmm. we agree we, you know we'd never done it up until that point so we we took a step back and had to you know swallow our pride and actually learn an awful lot during this process but we knew we were onto the right thing because we've lived this life in a different context so again it goes back to that moment of how do you see those changes and when they happen it's brilliant no, that's awesome. That is awesome. So with all of your guys' wealth of experience, what are the biggest opportunities you see in using data and the future around microfinance, nonprofits, Christian banking? You know, what do you guys see sort of as the future of all of this? I suppose, I mean, there's no magic answer. The fact is data, just doing this, the simple basics well and consistently will get you 95% of the way, yeah. Yeah. Uh, because I think the majority of what's out there, including in maybe the, even the banking sphere, is not perfect. Yeah. So if you're doing the simple basics well, using basic data uh, and just doing it consistently over and over again, will will take a long, long way. And I think that there's a dramatic improvement there for that. I think it also helps identify problems sooner, um, ensuring definitely that you're getting the right and targeting the right clients, and ultimately. All of that, doing the basics well, means that you can bring greater impact because you, you actually have more resource to do it. Yeah. it I, I don't think it's rocket science in any shape or form. What we did 
we, when I say we, it's not just Tom and I. There's a, there was a large team yeah. who did this, you know. Yeah. So we're not attributing this to just the two of us, although, you know, we are obviously the the two people on screen. The fact is that that, that it takes a team, it takes a team yeah. effort. But Absolutely. so I think just doing the basics really well and consistently will give yeah. you a very long way. Yeah. And to your, you know, to your question, obviously one of the things Paul and I have stepped away from Vision Fund now. Um, for no other reason, we felt called to do something different, but based on all of our experience commercially, the, you know, Paul and I were at uh, Vision Fund, World Vision for six years, seven years between us, you know, um, each of us going through that experience. And we've now landed on this new project, IFBank, as you said. And for us, that's that's the key. And Paul used a very important word, impact. You know, we want to see finance be of impact, a positive impact in the world in which uh, we live. Our faith, our our relationship with our God and what we see, the challenge that, you know, Jesus left us when he went was to to find a way to impact the world in which we live. And that's where we want to go. We see our next chapter. And, you know, and our experience with Vision Fund and the use of data to make sure that we impacted people they were seeking to serve was key. And as we now step into a new chapter of our lives and a new challenge, we also see the same question again. You know, how do we how do we use our this business to have a real impact in the world? And, you know, that's sort of a real challenge. But a real opportunity for both of us we are going to learn in this process but more importantly we want to see something of use for god's kingdom and for this world at large and that's sort of yeah again part of our journey part of our progression part of the reason why paul and i are onto our next adventure together because you know god keeps opening and joining those dots or friend of a friend as paul put it earlier keeps prodding us forward to something else that's awesome all right we're gonna have to devote another interview to that because i want to ask more questions about a Christian bank, but that'll be for another time. So until then though, what are some things we can pray about for you both? You go first this time. <laughs> ah, you're a, I, I've seen the way you work. Courteous, before. courteous, courteous as always. <laughs> this is always. Uh, I, I, I think for us, a couple of things that we've learned um, keeping this humble, you know, we've yeah. we've had an incredible amount of experience during, uh, you know, both uh, our career commercially and through uh, World Vision and into this next step. And but we both recognise, as Paul said, most times it's about the people around us, so a yeah. team. And that's not whilst we may have a uh, a, you know, a dream, a goal, something we want. To, we are very keen, very aware of the fact we can't do this alone. So yeah. simply, we want to be able to engage people in this process. So. The fact of asking for prayer and being, we want, we cover prayer all over the place for this and to be able to go through those things. Bit of patience, you know, the, we stepped out about uh, 18 months ago into this new venture. There's this thing called COVID and the pandemic happening. And, I, you know, I don't know if people have heard of this stuff. Yeah, what is it? It is. Yeah, exactly. It's It has impacted our, what we thought was our trajectory and our journey. Um, with, you know, as you can see, we're animated, you know, desire, you know, we want to move forward and God has had to teach us things in this process. Mm -hmm. But actually today, right now, I think I'll, I'll talk for both of us and basically say we are very aware that that was a necessarily deliberate journey and adventure that God's got us on. So we're not the reason that COVID exists. We're not the focal point and everything else in the world has fallen apart because Paul and Tom needed to learn a lesson. But we do know that we've gone through this process to, mm. you know, evaluate and refine and think about. And as we've talked about today, you know, reframe our desire for this next adventure that we want to serve and put his kingdom and other people first. And, you know, so a prayer help us to be able to make sure that that continues to be our focus, that he needs to be in the center. And that what we're doing is not about Paul and I and our resumes, but far more about what we've learned that actually finance can help yeah. hugely. And if we do it well. And, yeah. Uh, and space to listen to him yeah. really whenever he speaks. Yeah. I think we've, we've been blessed with that actually with the, the COVID pandemic period in the sense of apart from frustration that we were about to sort of kind of go and launch and try and see if others wanted to join us in this journey back in March 2020. Um, and then, uh, then, then it stopped. Um, but the reality is just space to listen. It has been a blessing too. So. Those are things you could pray for as well. Oh, yeah. That sounds wonderful. That sounds wonderful. Well, thank you both again for joining me for the Data for God interview series today. Thank it's you. been an absolute blessing. And thank you for all the listeners back at home. I hope you all have a blessed rest of your day.
Have a good day. Take care. See you next time. Bye.